I would like to announce the fact that next year we are intending to hold the Strings 2008 meeting in, uh, at CERN. As you know from the first talk, we will have collisions, hopefully. <laughs> it's not clear to me that we'll have any, any new discoveries. And certainly we will not be able to match the quality and the atmosphere in this meeting, but we'll do our best and we hope you'll be there. Anyway, our first speaker this afternoon, or this, uh, the after coffee session, is uh, Nathan Sarberg from the Institute for Advanced Studies, and we will talk about Beyond the Standard Model. No, beyond. Thank you, Luis. Yes, <laughs> Can people hear me? Can people hear me? Okay, one yes. So first I'd like, like everybody else, thank the organizers for putting together such a nice meeting for the hospitality, and thank also the, all the speakers for the stimulating talks. And finally, I would like to thank them for giving me the opportunity to talk here. And the picture that we see here is actually quite appropriate because I'm not going to talk about string theory. In fact, this is the last time you will see the word string in this talk. <laughs> this talk is in the wrong place and in the wrong time. I'll be talking about su supersymmetry, so perhaps it should be in the supersymmetry 2007. Should there perhaps be in the supersymmetry series of meetings, the 2007 one? Be describing work with Michael Dine and Scott Thomas in a paper which will appear momentarily. But this work is also in the wrong time, not only in the wrong place. And let's pretend we are sometimes in the future. And we are in the 2012 SUSE meeting. And I'm going to make a set of assumptions which I'll take forward in the rest of the talk. So I'm going to assume that this is CERN, the LHC, the LHC turned on. And the LHC, or maybe if we are fortunate, even the Tevatron, will discover some of the particles of the MSSM. This is a very strong assumption. We have no evidence that this will happen, but I don't think it's that crazy. So let's assume that the MSSM is discovered, or at least some of its particles. The MSSM has five massive Higgs particles. Let's also assume that at least some of them have, will have been discovered by that time. And also, there is no other particle outside the MSSM. These are the three assumptions I'll make. And we'll try to take it from here and see what it is that we can learn from these three assumptions, which are not that crazy, in my view. I'd like first to spend the first few slides reviewing things which are really very well known, things about the MSSM. But before I do that, I'd like to give some general introduction about the two Higgs doublet model. The two Higgs doublet model has 13 real parameters, up to various symmetries. There are three dimensionful parameters. These are these quadratic terms in the Lagrangian. This is manifest, these two are manifestly real. This one, using a phase rotation of H up, we can make it also real. So we have three dimensionful parameters and ten dimensionless parameters. The parameters are such that these two Higgses are aligned, and SU2 cross U1 is broken to U1, to electromagnetism, and we parameterize the expectation values of H up and H down in terms of a dimensionful number v and a phase beta which describes the ratio between these two. We know the number v already. The number v is 174 GeV. We do not know the parameter beta, but later in the talk I'll say what we know about the parameter beta. We don't know its value. This is a number of great interest. So this is the most general two Higgs doublet model. The MSSM is a very special two Higgs doublet model. The three dimensionful parameters are still there, and we don't know what they are. However, the ten real parameters of the coefficients of the quartic terms are completely determined. They arise from the d terms and the potential from the d square. So the coefficients have two things which are important for us. One is that we know what the coefficients are. They are given in terms of the gauge couplings. And second, they're very small. Since they're very small, the mass of the Higgs should be very small. And that will really be the subject of this talk. Overall, we start from two doublets. So after the Higgs mechanism, we are left with a number of massive fields. The first is the light Higgs little h, which is a standard model like Higgs. In addition, the MSSM has two, single, two neutral Higgs particles. One of them is CP even, one of them is CP odd. And there is also a charged Higgs h plus. It's really important that the MSSM potential is always real, and therefore we can assign CP properties to the Higgses. Now, instead of parameterizing the MSSM potential in terms of the three real dimensionful numbers, the coefficient of H up square, the coefficient of H down square, and the coefficient of H up times H down, 
it is more convenient to parameterize it in terms of these three numbers. The first is V, the expectation value of the Higgs. We already know what it is. Then the mass of one of these particles, the pseudo-scalar one, and tan beta, which is the ratio between the two waves. This parameterization turns out to be very convenient. Now, we will assume for simplicity that tan beta is much bigger than one in a limit taken with MA held fixed. I will later motivate why this is a good limit to study, and I will also explain intuitively what this limit means. Now we have a very straightforward calculation. We know what the potential is. We go to the minimum. We know what the expectation values are. We go to the minimum. We expand the small fluctuations. We diagonalize the mass matrix. This is a, an elementary exercise in classical field theory. And we solve for the masses of the various excitations. So we see these are the values, and I'd like to make some comments about them. I expanded them in this limit I'll be interested in, with tan beta is large, the cotangent beta is small. And in that limit, the mass of the lightest Higgs is essentially the same as the mass of the Z, 91 GeV. The corrections here are negative. I did not exhibit them explicitly, just put the minus sign. And therefore, there is an inequality that the mass of the Higgs is lighter than the mass of the Z. I've already said that the quartic couplings are small, and therefore the mass of the Higgs, which is approximately the mass of the Z, is much less than the Higgs expectation value V. So this is 91 GV, this is 174. If we look at this limit of large tan beta, we see some peculiarities in the, in the formulas for the spectrum. For example, M square H is the same as the mass of A. So A and H are degenerate. The reason is that in this limit of large tan beta, there is an enhanced U1 symmetry of the potential, and H and A combine to a complex scalar field. That's why their masses are approximately the same. Similarly, this mass relation reflects an SU2 symmetry, which is obtained when we turn off the SU2 gauge coupling, and therefore MW is missing. So A and H plus minus form a triplet of a custodial SU2 symmetry, which is useful here. The story I've just told you is known to be very bad. It's bad because it already violates some experimental values. Lab 2 tells us that the Higgs cannot be lighter than 114 GeV, and recall that on the previous slide we said it has to be less than 91 GeV. So this is one problem. How can we avoid a contradiction? There are two things which can allow us to push the mass of the Higgs up. First, if you recall, the mass of the Higgs was the mass of the Z minus something, which goes to zero as we make tan beta large. So this is the first argument, and perhaps the strongest, that tan beta should not be too small. So the ratio between H up and H down expectation value has to be a large value. So tan beta has to be large. Also, we'll soon see that we need large radiative corrections to, do, to take us beyond from MZ to 114 GeV. Let me say intuitively what large tan beta means. Since the Higgs expectation value resides entirely in H up, the problem really factorizes in this limit to two decoupled scalars, two decoupled Higgses. In this limit of large tan beta, with fixed MA, the mass of the A particle, the electroweak breaking happens mostly due to H up, because the other wave is very small. The light Higgs, H, is predominantly from the H up doublet. So we have H up, which is very much like a standard model Higgs, the whole doublet, and H down is a massive doublet, giving rise to the charge Higgs, H plus minus, the scalar H, and the pseudoscalar A. So these four scalar fields arise predominantly from H down. So this is the intuition of large tan beta, which will be important for us. I also mentioned that we need large radiative corrections. The radiative corrections have to be large in order to avoid this discrepancy. With large tan beta, we push the Higgs up to MZ, and the radiative corrections will do the rest. And it's not just pushing the mass from 91 to 114. The radiative corrections add something to M square, so we really need to push the mass from 91 square to 114 square, and that's why they have to be large. In order to achieve large radiative corrections, we need to do whatever we have, we used whatever we have, whoops. So the stop line runs in the loop. So what we need to do is either have large stop masses, so the stops have to be very heavy, or use this coupling, it's a trilinear coupling which breaks supersymmetry, technically it's called an A term, it's two stops in a Higgs. This coupling also has to be large. So either we have large trilinear couplings or we have large stops. 
Now, if we assume that the A terms, these terms are small, so one possibility is that the A terms are large, this is this option. The alternative, if this term is negligible, then the mass of the stop has to be very big, it should be either 600 or 1000 dB, GV, depending on whether we go to one loop or two loops and depending on other parameters. In any event, it has to be large. This is a problem, because this option of large A terms is very hard to achieve in explicit models. When people have various models like gauge mediation and so forth, this coupling is typically very small. That's option problem number one. Problem number two, if we use renormalization group to run this coupling to very high energies, then such large A's are associated with fine tuning. So let's dismiss that as not very realistic and focus on the Higgs, on the stop. If we go with the stop, we face another problem. Intuitively, we started with, from the problem of the hierarchy problem. We needed all these super partners to keep the Higgs tame so that the Higgs would not get too heavy. Now we have the problem that the Higgs is too heavy, so we need to push the stop up. And that's why we face, again, problems of naturalness. More quantitatively, before we discussed essentially the quartic coupling and its renormalization, that's why we needed to push the quartic coupling larger. Now we see that the same large stop also causes renormalization of the quadratic term in the Lagrangian. So this is a bare term, and this is the one loop correction, which is proportional to m stop square times a logarithm. If lambda is big, this is the UV cutoff, then the logarithm essentially kills the 16 pi square of the loop. And we are left with a number here, which is very big, much bigger than the mass of the Higgs. So we have two big numbers here, which have to be fine-tuned to be canceled one against the other with precision of about 1%. This problem is te known technically as the supersymmetric little hierarchy problem, and it's viewed by many experts as one of the most serious problems in supersymmetry, perhaps a reason not to believe supersymmetry at all. So in the rest of the talk, I'll discuss what we can do about that. So let us assume that the MSSM is not the whole story. So we have at some energy around the electroweak scale, we have the MSSM, and at some higher scale, big M, we have new physics. And this scale M is bigger than the electroweak scale mu and the various soft breaking terms M Susie. So I'm going to have an expansion in small parameter epsilon, which I'm assumed to be much less than one, which is the ratio between M Susie and M or mu of M, which I assume to be of the same order of magnitude. So what do we do in such a situation? It's completely straightforward. Surprisingly, nobody has done it yet. We have to write the MSSM Lagrangian and consider various operator corrections to the MSSM. And we'll organize the operator corrections in terms of increasing powers of one over M. So in leading order, we have just the MSSM. Then we have parameter, various operators which are suppressed by one power of one over M or a power of epsilon. And then we have epsilon square, etc. In a normal field theory, this expansion in one over the heavy scale is really an expansion in dimensions of operators. So therefore, that's why we discuss high dimension operators which correct the Lagrangian. As we will see here, the expansion is non in dimensions, but in what can be called, in fact, Weinberg calls it the effective dimension of the operator. The effective dimension is such that it tells us what power of one over M comes about, is needed. And as we will see, we, have, uh, we will have operators of dimension 4 which are still suppressed by 1 over m and that's why they can be interesting. So they are not high dimension operators, these are high effective dimension operators. So now it's a very straightforward exercise, just make the list of all the operators we can add to the MSSM. It's completely straightforward. And surprisingly there are only two operators in the leading order. So at leading order, the MSSM is corrected by only two complex operators. The first is supersymmetric. We just take h up, h down, contract that to a singlet, square it. This is dimension 5, so we multiply by 1 over m. The second operator breaks supersymmetry. It's a quartic coupling in the Lagrangian, h up, h down, contracted to a singlet square. Since it breaks supersymmetry, there's an explicit factor of m susy here. And then on dimensional grounds, we have 1 over m. Unlike the MSSM potential, the coefficients of these two couplings are complex and they can lead to new sources of CP violation which could be interesting phenomenologically. So let's discuss these two operators in a little bit more detail. First, the first operator. 
This is a dimension five supersymmetric operator. There's no reason not to add it to the Lagrangian. With also a mu term, quadratic term that gives masses to the Higgses and to the Higgsinos, mu h up, h down. If we add these two terms together, we solve the F term equation, say, of h up or of h down, the, we get something which multiplies mu over m, so we'll call mu over m epsilon one. This is a small parameter of order, this small expansion parameter epsilon that we have. And we generate dimension four corrections to the Higgs potential. Again, notice these are dimension four operators which are suppressed by powers of one over m, so they have effective dimension five. They modify the Higgs potential, and in addition, this coupling also modifies Higgsinos and neutral, Chaginos and Neutralinos, so it has a lot of phenomenological consequences. So again, this is our first operator, dimension four correction to the MSSN potential. The second operator breaks supersymmetry. It can either be written this way or in terms of a spurion like that. So we have an explicit theta square dependence here. It leads again to a dimension four operator, another kind of operator in the Higgs potential. It's a dimension four operator with effective dimension five. And that's why it is interesting. It's a relatively low dimension, four, but it's small. The main result I'd like to get across, which will be the conse everything from this moment on will be consequences of what I'm, the sentence I'm going to say now, is that the surprise is that there are only two operators. One might think that if we start correcting the MSSN, will be tons of operators and we can do whatever we want. Yes, we can have a little bit more freedom if we add these operators, but not too much freedom. It's just right. <laughs> so we'll have two more operators. Let's examine what they do. So it's completely straightforward now. We take the Higgs potential of the MSSM. We add these two operators. It's not as general the, as the most general two Higgs doublet model, but we can calculate it. And not only that, since we have in mind an expansion in epsilon, we'll minimize the potential, find this, the vacuum, look at the small fluctuations around the vacuum, diagonalize them, and solve for the masses. And we'll do that in a power series in epsilon. And these are the answers, and for simplicity, I exhibit the answers only for large time beta. So let me make some comments about the corrections to the Higgs masses. Put the minimal, uh, the tree level answers were on an earlier transparency. This is the leading order in epsilon correction. First, the mass of A is not corrected. This is not very deep. In fact, this is a triviality because we use the A field to parametrize the potential. So what we do is solve for the masses express it to everything in terms of mass of A, the Higgs VEV, V, and tan beta, and then, therefore, the mass of A cannot be corrected, because this is an input parameter. These are the corrections of the other masses. Let's assume that tan beta is infinite. So this is negligible. We can cross these two terms out, and we see that we had only two operators. That was the first simplification. They are complex operators, so we have four parameters but most of them do not affect the Higgs masses at the leading order, so we are left with one number, the real part of epsilon two, and that's all. Epsilon one and the imaginary part of epsilon two do not affect the spectrum in the leading order. So using measurements, we can actually overdetermine epsilon two. It shows that we can get corrections to the spectrum, but the corrections are overdetermined, and that's good. In leading order in, tan beta, in the expansion in 1 over tan beta, the Higgs mass is not corrected, but it is corrected at the next order. There's a term cotangent beta and then real epsilon 1, and then there are various or higher order corrections, which I'll soon mention. And finally, this, correct, this is actually exact. I did not write here plus higher order corrections, and that reflects an, uh, this underlying SU2 custodial symmetry that I mentioned earlier. What about the light Higgs mass? At order epsilon, the, coefficient, the correction to MH is suppressed. Recall where we started. We started with the fact that the Higgs was very light. That was at the MSSM because the, the Cordy coupling was very small. This was the gauge coupling. Radiative corrections allow us to go up, but we contemplate not going as high as we could with the radiative corrections because we don't want to have the little hierarchy problem. So let us put the stops where they belong, around 300 GeV. So let's assume the stops are here, and the A terms are small, so this is also not a problem. Yet, the rest of the way from, that will bring us to about 100 GeV, the rest of the way can be done with these higher, higher corrections to the MSSM, and that's relatively easy to do 
we can either, you either use the order epsilon correction I had on the previous slide. For example, put tan beta to be 10 and let epsilon 1 be 0.06. That's already good enough to do the job. Or we can continue to order epsilon square. There are tons of operators that order epsilon square. We can parameterize their effect on the light Higgs mass as v square times this epsilon 3 square. And this epsilon 3 just needs to be bigger than 0.3. So when we put all the numbers, we see that we can really solve this little hierarchy problem in a very simple way. Put the stops where they belong, have no A terms, add these high dimension operators, and the new physics is around 1 to 5 TeV, and that can solve the problem. So one can ask, can we go to higher energies? What kind of physics can lead to these new high dimension operators? Do we need very, biz very bizarre things or just mundane things? Since I've, all I've done was kind of an operator analysis, it's clear that almost everything you anything you write down is going to give these operators because they are the leading operators. So here are some options, something like the NMSSM, except that I'm adding an S squared term. So imagine we add an SU2 singlet. So the super potential for the S field is that the scale M is S squared plus coupling to H up, H down. If we integrate out S, we clearly generate an H up, H down square term. We can also put triplets with various hypercharges, charge, hypercharge, plus and minus charges. We can add a U1 prime gauge field. This is very common in string constructions. They do the job. Or we can have what is perhaps more interesting, a strongly coupled Higgs sector. It can also do the job. It's complicated. It leads to high demand two. In the high dimension operators or high effective dimension operators which correct the MSSM. So what are the consequences? First of all, the little, the Susie little hierarchy problem can easily be avoided by allowing such corrections to the MSSM. Equivalently, I don't think we should interpret the little hierarchy problem as fine tuning, but as a pointer for new physics. This is kind of turning things around. The fact that we have a problem with the light stop, with, with, with the Higgs, that it's not as light as it could have been, should be interpreted as the fact that perhaps there is new physics that does the job. In fact, people have been suggesting various possibilities for solving the little hierarchy problem. There is a long list in the literature, various microscopic models, and they are all special cases of this very general operator analysis, because nothing else can do it. In fact, there could be measurable deviations from the MSSM at the LHC. One thing, we can me pretend measuring all these masses and they don't fit the MSSM or don't do not fit the radiatively corrected MSSM. For example, imagine the stop has been found. So the stop is found at 300 GeV and then we really have a discrepancy. The MSSM cannot account for the mass of the Higgs. In that case, what we need to do is to organize the corrections to the MSSM using these operators. And these operators lead to something which again I stress is over-constrained. We have very small numbers to parameterize tons of numbers. The masses of the Higgs, the Higgsin, the Charginos and Neutralinos numbers are corrected by the same operators. We have basically one, one or two real numbers which, which are, affect many observables. There are new decay modes, there is new CP violation, that could be interesting for baryogenesis and so forth. So I'd like to finish my talk with an optimistic scenario for the future. People ask me, what do you think will happen? So this is my optimistic scenario for the future. First of all, the LHC discovers supersymmetry. That's number one. Okay, I, I don't think it's guaranteed, but I don't think the probability for that is totally negligible. I don't want to assign numbers to that. <laughs> Imagine a light stop is found around, say, 300 GeV. Given that there's supersymmetry, that's, again, not a very big assumption. Because where will the superpartners be? They will be in the few hundred GV, say 300 GV. The first good thing about that is that there is no little hierarchy problem because the stop is light. So I think that is quite likely. As I said, with such light stop, there is no little hierarchy problem. However, the MSSM is in trouble because the stop is not heavy enough to account for the mass of the Higgs. So what will come to the rescue? Well, even before that, we, had, we can measure the masses of other Higgses, and they also don't quite fit the MSSM prediction. With the, star, with the light Higgs, we already, we, I think it's quite likely that it's not going to work. And then, 
it's not such a stretch to assume that this thing happens. So what will come to the rescue, this will clearly be sign of new physics. So we organize the corrections to the MSSM using these I dimension operators, which are actually dimension four. We throw in one more parameter, we fit all the data, and we have rationale for new physics in one to five TeV. Rationale that gives us the rationale to build the new machine which will explore the new physics. <laughs> so I think I'll stop here. Thank you. We have a few minutes for questions or comments. Yeah. Uh, what's the reason you can only write these two operators at this order? I mean, why didn't you write a D term, for example? Would it be higher order? Yeah, because uh, if you first think of supersymmetric operators, then you could be correction to the Kelly potential that starts at dimension six. Uh, we need two powers of one over m, not one. Supersymmetric operators and corrections to the gauge coupling. And it will take you two, two seconds to realize that this is all you could do. If you discuss non-supersymmetric operators, you can organize them with the Spurion, and the Spurion analysis will show you that this is the leading operator. It's one of these things that I don't know how to prove, but you sit down and start writing things and you immediately convince yourself. Hola, José. Uh, Red. No. Use this one. Hello? Yes. yes. Regarding the new symmetries you mentioned that you gain when you take the large tangent beta uh, limit, uh, what about these new terms? Uh, do they respect these uh, new, new symmetries that you gain when you take the large well, tangent beta or yeah. not? Because uh, there may be something beyond yeah, that. Yeah, they, these two terms break the U1, but this is, this is a symmetry which is only good for bookkeeping. It's not a symmetry of the MSSM. It's an approximate symmetry of the MSSM when you turn, on, when you turn off the beam U term, or what I call it here, MUD. Yeah, this but the symmetry is not preserved by, the, by these operators that I added. But the real relevant one uh, term uh, among the two that you mentioned is the second one because it's yeah, the I think both are relevant. But mostly the second, isn't it? The epsilon two. That's for the for the masses of the heavy Higgses. For the light one, if we go back for the yes, light yes, Higgs, it's I the remember. first one. Mm -hmm. For the light Higgs, I don't know which one is Take more relevant thing. for you. Let's <laughs> take the gauge. Yes. Uh, Wait, wait a second. He's trying to answer. Is the second one? So the one I, the I second one affects and the large the tangent beta. You the first correct. Yeah, that's the As I said, with tan beta equals ten, which mm -hmm. is not that crazy, and epsilon one point oh six, this is good enough to correct for the mass of the Higgs with light stop. Mm -hmm. So the three level, the minimal thing is about ninety. With the radiative corrections, you bring it to about hundred to hundred and five, depending what you do with the numbers. Tan beta, which is a ten and epsilon 1, which is, uh, I think I put it on the next slide, and epsilon 1, which is 0 0.06, already does the job. Now, I just wonder so if there is you to some relevant slide. role for these new symmetries that you gain when you take the large tangent beta regime. Yeah, I, I was curious about yeah. it. I think the this, this symmetry is only good for organizing the calculation. It's not a symmetry of the model. It, right. it, the other terms in the MSSM don't respect it. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's only a bookkeeping device. Okay. Thank and you. it's explicitly broken because tan beta is not infinite. Yes, um, uh, it seems in principle you can solve or ameliorate the little hierarchy problem, but on the other hand, um, maybe um, there is this problem which is always around, which is the mu problem. Here you are introducing a second scale, typically also mass terms, so you will have two mu problems, and uh, uh, you need to have certain relationship between those two parameters to get improve the little hierarchy problem. Yeah, is that, that right? Yeah, so the approach that Many of us follow is we start from very high energies and we go down and we want to explain why various numbers are where they are. Why is there a mu term? Why does it have the value it has? Why are the soft terms where they are? And we also have to explain why this scale m is where it is. This is an excellent question and we can discuss it. The point of view in this talk was to do exactly the opposite. We start from very low energies, we measure the numbers, 
They are what they are. Are they con self-consistent? And we see that the numbers are likely not to be self-consistent. This is this problem, the little hierarchy problem. So we collect it by the smallest amount possible in a systematic expansion, and then we see that we manage to, to survive. Now, if that whole thing survives and the op my optimistic scenario materializes, it would be great. I would agree to that, and then we'll worry about the mu, the mu problem. But alternatively, you can start from the mu problem and go from the top and try and find new mechanisms to do that. Now, the mu problem is not as severe if you throw in a singlet, and the singlet was one of the mechanisms to, to do. Yeah, so we'll have the M problem. So, <laughs> but that's what we do in physics all the time. We have physics at some energy scale, and we gradually go to higher and higher energies. So here we are not very ambitious. We're not trying to do the whole thing, but only pushing it up from, say, 100 GV to 1 TV. This is this talk. Sandeep? So, Nadi, if I understood correctly, these additional operators have phases that can break CP. Yep. And so if you take the scale of new physics to be what you need it to be, uh, to solve the little hierarchy problem, would you, and you take the phases to be order one, would that already conflict with experiment? Uh, I think not, but we have not fully analyzed it. However, these, could, these phases could do all sorts of other interesting things, in particular baryogenesis, electroweak baryogenesis is a lot easier in this model for one thing, the stop, you need to have a large, strong first order phase transition. So since we have a light, lighter stop than people usually contemplate, the radiative corrections of the stop make the transition first order. Second, you need CP violation in order to make baryons, so these phases are handy. I don't think they contaminate things because, as far as corrections, because they only appear in, suppressed, first of all, by this epsilon, and second, it's only in the Higgs sector, so you have to propagate this information but we have to the rest of the model, but we have not analyzed that in detail. This would be a good exercise to do. And uh, you, you mentioned a couple times the uh, uh, NMSSM. Uh, we have an extended U1 with a singlet generating the mu term. In that case, the H up, H down is not, not a gauge singlet. Are the, is the HUHD squared, I mean, it would, it would, because the S would, would presumably carry some extra U1 charge, which is cancel, canceling the HUHD, which is why the mu term is forbidden from the superpotential. No, I did, I did when people say the NMSSM, what they usually mean is, is a solution to the mu problem. We want to understand why mu is there, so we add the singlet, and then, in most cases, the, this term is not added, so all we have is this and then S cubed, and the story starts from there. We take, when I said NMSSM, I meant the NMSSM spectrum of particles, but not with, this, with a much broader set of allowed couplings. So I'm putting both a mu term by hand and an S square term by hand. Then I have to face the problem that our host asked me about, which is a very good question. I'm not giving an answer to that. But the question is, can we parameterize the information that will be seen at the LHC? And, and I think that could do the job. So last question, Edward. Uh, I'm confused, I'm afraid, about why your non supersymmetric operator has effective dimension 5 instead of 6. Did you had this boyan, which was the expectation value of an F term, to get the theta squared at the end of the first yeah. line. Yeah, that, there are two different ways of counting dimension of a spurion. The way I like to think of it is a spurion is dimensionless number, and its F component has dimension 1. That, that when, if you think in terms of supergravity with m3 powers of m3 half, there's only one power of m3 half. So you to just imagine this is a gravity-mediated model. This is just for the purpose of the counting. Then I'm after counting in powers of m3 half over m. And m3 half is around 100 GeV. Does, does this answer your question? Okay, I think that further questions should be asked in private. Let's thank our speaker again.